Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to my art appreciation students of Lady Colleges. Welcome. So you have chosen the best school in preparation for the, being a member of the Philippine National Police or the AFP or the Bureau of Fire or be part of the Dip Ed family or other local government units in service. Now, we are, our subject for today is art appreciation. You know, what is art? How would you define art? What is an art? What is an art? So art is the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Now, if the thing is not being appreciated and you do not value the thing is it an art huh if the thing in front of you say for example it, let's have a plane talking There's, there is a um, a waste of the carabao you step in it or a waste of the dog you step in it and of course it's, it's so smelly and you have to shout yuck yuck do you appreciate it? Literally, no. So, it's not art because of that. But for others, it can be. Might It might be that they would appreciate it. In fact, we use it as fertilizer or they would picture it and make a, well, uh, a, a decorative on it. So, art is actually subjective by nature. It depends on how the viewer would look at it. It is not obsolete. Uh, it is dynamic. It depends on how the viewer would see it. Like, for example, pornography. What is pornography? Is it an art? It depends on you. Okay? So say, for example, my finger. Look at my finger. And I'm going to play something on my finger. How would you react on this? what is the perception of your mind so it's quite green no green para siyang, ano? let us be frank you think it was something like an intercourse but what if for me i just place it here because i just want to do like that so eventually it depends on how the viewer or how the person relates on that particular object it is subjective art appreciation now, let us go back to our history and when and where did art started? During the time of Adam and Eve, is it an art? There was, was there already an art? Yes, precisely, because the Lord created the universe with all the art in it. The sky, the moon, the sea, the mountain, and lastly the human beings, the curves of their bodies, Adam and Eve. And in fact, Adam and Eve, realizing that they were naked, make a piece of art. They cover their bodies with, with what? With leaves it, to cover their sexual organ. Okay, so there was already art in it. When the Lord created this empty universe, there was art on his mind when he created those things. All things are created by God in his own image and likeness. So we have to appreciate them. Okay? So we go to the history of art. So there are process on how are you going to appreciate art. So you just read, you view first the clippings for the meantime. Welcome to a journey through the history of art. We will travel along a timeline from the caves to the 19th century. My name is Dr. Jean Willett. Let's begin by making the familiar unfamiliar. It is with Baroque art that we begin to see distinct differences within a period, differences that are cultural and national. 
These differences mean that depending upon the nation or territory, art has a distinctly different set of rules, and the tasks of the artist varied greatly. Given that the modern nations emerged in the 17th century, changing how art functioned, how can we define the Baroque? The answer is twofold. First, the Baroque can be defined in terms of a general style, and second, the Baroque can be discussed in specific nations, Italy, France, and Holland. The term Baroque, like many period designations, is not a complementary one, meaning a bizarre taste that does not follow the rules of classical, which leads us to the basic definition of the Baroque, its contrast to classicism. Despite the fact that Baroque was a reaction to and an adaptation of the classical tradition, the art of the Renaissance was established as a gold standard. The art historian Heinrich Wolfing united the national uses of Baroque tendencies into a unifying schema of contrasting pairs in which classical art is the presumed norm. Although Wolfing understood the importance of cultural context, he concentrated on style or a selected group of formal components. Renaissance art, as exemplified by Raphael, was linear, meaning that all the contours are totally visible, and the painting technique was smooth. In contrast, Baroque contours are hard to discern. As we see in Caravaggio, shapes and forms get lost in the shadows. The contrast of light and dark was called chiaroscuro or tenebroso, dramatic effects found in the work of Georges Delatour. Baroque painting technique was outside the lines, was brushy, often eliminating outlines. The painterly technique of Peter Paul Rubens and the high colors he favored were characteristic of the Baroque. The light of the Renaissance clarifies, makes all elements visible in a unified all-over clarity. In contrast, light sources in the Baroque are specific and focused, leaving unilluminated areas shrouded in obscurity, as we see in Rembrandt's The Night Watch. Renaissance composition is organized along the plane, frontally, as the actors are posed on a stage, as in Giotto's Lamentation. While Baroque allows for a recession, moving back into depth, characteristic of the landscapes of Nicolas Poussin. When we compare Michelangelo's David to the David of Bernini, we see that the classical art demands balance, calm, and poise. Michelangelo's David is gathering his courage. In contrast, the dynamism of the Baroque hero done by Bernini is that of an open form, an opened stance. David is coiled and ready to launch a stone. Donatello gives the viewer one preferred view, but Bernini requires him or her to walk around the sculpture. The Portinari altarpiece by Hugo van der Goes is a display of Renaissance multiplicity, many, many elements, each of which is self-sufficient. In comparison, Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith is slaying Holofernes, all of the parts are fused, dependent, and cannot be separated. All of these paired comparisons add up to a static renaissance and a dynamic baroque, each style exhibiting a unique sense of time. Renaissance art is timeless. The scene summarizes everything, as in Raphael's School of Athens. But in baroque art, time, like the lines, is dynamic, ongoing, as dramatic as the fall of the Phaeton by Rubens. Obviously, not every Renaissance or classical and Baroque work can fit neatly into all the contrasting categories. This is because style is too broad a categorization to provide anything more than a general distinction. To be more specific, it is necessary to examine the role of the artist and the purpose of art in specific national and historical contexts. The Baroque style was a long-lasting one, lingering well into the 18th century and morphing into the Rococo in France. Despite its importance, the Baroque would be dismissed by the Renaissance scholar Jakob Burckhardt as a decline or as a degeneration of classicism. It was Burckhardt who inspired Wolfine in his separation of the classical from the Baroque style.
This painting is the death of Socrates. It was completed in 1787 by the French neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David. Born in 1748, David was perhaps the most important political painter of his time, painting first for Louis XVI, then for the French revolutionaries, and finally for Napoleon, until his exile to Brussels, following the return of the French monarchy. As the title suggests, the painting depicts the death of Socrates. Socrates was an ancient Greek philosopher during the Athenian classical period of the 5th and 4th century before Jesus Christ. According to Plato, one of Socrates' pupils, the great philosopher was found guilty of impiety in 399 before Christ. Given the choice to either renounce his beliefs and go into exile, or be executed, Socrates chose the latter and drank poison hemlock, much to the despair of his students. This painting is undeniably part of the neoclassical movement. Indeed, the very subject matter of the painting is as classical as it gets, representing famous Greek philosophers and writers. The attention to detail, the obsession over human anatomy, and the two-dimensional frieze-like structure of the painting bring back notions of the classical era, the time of Romans and Greeks. Socrates, pointing upwards with his right hand, can be seen as a throwback to Raphael's School of Athens. Here, it is Plato who is pointing upwards. Therefore, this painting is not only adopting classical art, but it is also influenced by Renaissance art, a period that was a rebirth of the classical era, making this the perfect neoclassical painting. The scene of the death of Socrates is a prison. The walls of the room are flat and dark, and chains can be found around it. There are very few ornaments. The painting is describing stern reality, contrasting with the Rococo paintings of the same era. Socrates is in the middle, sitting up on his bed, grabbing the chalice of hemlock, while his pupils look away in despair. As we progress through the painting, we notice Credo, a friend of Socrates, clutching the philosopher's legs, as if to beg him not to drink the hemlock. Around him, his pupils are lamenting their beloved master's choice, and Xanthippe, Socrates' wife, is waving goodbye. Plato is also represented, though at a much older age than normal. Indeed, the famous philosopher would have been 29 years old, but he is here portrayed as an older man. The philosopher is looking down as if to sadly accept his teacher's death. Around him, ink and paper can be found, indicating Jacques-Louis David's personal acknowledgement of Plato's historical and philosophical works, most notably the Phaedo, which depicts the trial and death of Socrates. Socrates is the main focus of the painting. He's the brightest figure in the room, and all eyes are directed at him. Furthermore, the saturation in the colors is increased at the center, urging the audience to look at the primary action of the tableau. As he is discussing the immortality of the soul, Socrates is reaching with his left hand to grab the chalice of Hemlock and points upwards with his right hand, indicating where his soul would go after his death. Socrates is calm, stoic, and rational compared to his pupils who are overwhelmed with emotion. As they urge him not to commit suicide, Socrates becomes a symbol of strength, determination, and commitment to ideals. Socrates is also idealized. At the age of 70, he would not have looked so muscular as he is depicted. David wants to show the immortality of ideas and the youth of the French revolutionary movement. Indeed, David had a purpose when he painted this scene. 1787 was a time of great tension in France. Because of its involvement in a number of wars, including the War of American Independence, France was left bankrupt. The hardest hit by this Great Depression was the third estate. The majority of the populace could not even afford simple needs, such as bread. This economic hardship was layered with new Enlightenment thinking from French philosophers, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire, who pushed for political and social reform. With a weak economy, an angered populace, and Enlightenment thinking to back them up, France was set for a great revolution. David wanted to illustrate the ideal revolutionary. A man who is willing to accept death for his ideas, here of liberty, equality, and fraternity. He illustrates a man who is fearless of death, who is ready for whatever may come in order to change the political and social landscape of France. David would become an important member of this revolution, organizing cultural and semi-religious events for his friend, Robespierre. When I visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art and entered the room with all the David paintings, I could not decide if I wanted to do this presentation on the death of Socrates or his painting of Lavoisier and his wife. Both are very beautiful paintings, but 
the death of Socrates offers something more. Without even knowing about the story and the purpose behind the painting, I could feel the power, the strength, the stoic commitment of the central character as he was about to take his life. His central placement, his physical strength, and the lighting that accentuate his features all seem to indicate that he is supposed to be looked up to, that he is the ideal man. Indeed, the death of Socrates is a warning. It is a message to all revolutionaries that they have to be prepared to die for what they believe in. This has been the death of Socrates. Woolly mammoths, steppe bison, and other large mammals once roamed alongside people across Eurasia. Tens of thousands of years later, we may have a glimpse into this Ice Age world through the cave art left behind by early humans. Around 400 art-filled caves and shelters, predominantly located in France and Spain, have been discovered so far. Some of the most elaborate prehistoric artwork exists in caves in France, known as Lascaux Grotto and Chauvet Pont d'Arc. Cave art dates as far back as 65,000 years ago to the time of the Neanderthals. Though, Radiocarbon dating and other methods have revealed most art to be less than 40,000 years old and created by Homo sapiens. The majority of cave art depicts animals that humans would have encountered or hunted during the Ice Age, such as mammoths, horses, lions, aurochs, and deer. Some human figures and other symbols have also been discovered. Cave paintings were mostly created with red or black pigments made from rocks. Some artworks were painted directly onto cave walls, while some were first engraved into the stone with tools. Occasionally, the artists would follow the natural contours of the stone walls to accentuate an animal's features. Ever since the late 1800s, people have debated the meaning and purpose of cave art. Some scholars think cave paintings were created by shamans who would go deep into caves and enter a trance-like state, drawing animals they encountered in the spirit world. Symbols repeated across artworks may indicate that those symbols had agreed upon meanings among the artists. Thus, perhaps cave art also represents the earliest form of graphic communication. In reality, cave art may have been created for a variety of reasons. While we may never know with absolute certainty why cave art was made or the meaning behind individual paintings, these works give us insight into the evolving minds of our prehistoric ancestors and the world in which they lived. By one view, cave artists were prehistoric naturalists. Their detailed drawings may teach us about the appearance and behavior of animals that have long been extinct. But perhaps more significant, a part of our never-ending quest to find out who we are and where we came from, cave art may provide evidence of a time when humans were first able to etch their thoughts in stone. Okay, so for your assignment this week, you have to answer step three and four. You place it in a long carbon band, minimum eight carbon band, to be submitted on Friday, not later than 12 noon, on, in my Google account, Gmail account pala, huh? So make sure to submit it, step three and step four, activity, in eight long cupid handwritten 
send it to me before September 4 on or before 12 o'clock noon. Okay? Have a good day. Do not stress yourself. Look good, feel good, and smell good. And most especially, taste good. Okay? Love you guys. Bye-bye for now. See you next meeting.